Uh, hi, this is Rush, and I thought I would talk to you about a book that I just finished the revisions of that will go to press um, in a few months. It's part of a series uh, called The Introductions to Greek and Roman Drama, published by a London house called Bloomsbury. I was the last person to finish their volume, so I'm the last volume in the series, and the good news about that is that perhaps because they wanted to bribe me, they've allowed me to include some photos in this series. There are very few photo people usually can include photographs. So I got to include some photographs. Um, the introduction is to Euripides' Electra, um, and it was a book written to a word limit. Um, it's a lot more difficult actually to write in that manner because you can't just expand and say everything you want to say and take your time doing it. You actually have to be con relatively concise. There's only 60,000 words in the book, which is not a particularly long book at all. So I thought I would tell you a little bit, a la the fifth grade, when I used to have to give a book report, this is something like a book report on the book that I um, just finished revising. Um, oh, by the way, I'm uh, speaking to you from Kithara, uh, island in Greece where I have been sheltering um, happily, but not by plan uh, for the last six weeks. And it looks like I'll be here for a little while longer. Anyway, I won't uh, take six weeks to tell you what I have to say about, uh, about this book, but I will give you a, a sort of outline of it so you get some sense of the structure of it and the uh, uh, issues that are covered um, and how I decided to, to organize it since I had some freedom to do so. Um, I begin, uh, the book has nine chapters, an introduction, which is fairly standard, no conclusion, uh, nine chapters. The first one is, is basically what I call theatrical background. And that stems from my view that you can't really understand a work of um, dramatic literature or play, a piece of theater, um, if you don't understand the kind of theater for which it was written. Uh, that means the conventions, the nature of the actual theatrical space, kinds of actors that were used. In the case of Greek tragedy, of course, there are all sorts of conventions that are foreign to us, but were basic to the form of the drama. And you can't really understand Greek tragedy if you don't understand that in the same way that it's really hard to understand Shakespeare if you think he was running for, you know, for a indoor proscenium arts theater, which he wasn't. So it's the same idea. And so theatrical background goes, goes into that. And I've covered that sort of thing in other books, Greek tragic theater, understanding Greek tragic theater, things like that. The second chapter um, was designed to sort of lay out the plot, um, the, borrowing the idea from Aristotle that plot is the soul of tragedy, from poetics. I tend to agree with that, at least for tragedy in a lot of great plays. It is the organization of events much more than the characters. We love characters, but the Greeks, eh, characters are fine. But remember, if one actor played many characters, the whole notion of character identification and acting is very different than for the Greeks than it would have been for us. So plot's important. So the what happens and how tries to lay out the scenario of the play. But to do so, I decided not to just sort of chunk it up, but to divide it into what I, what I call movements and then subsections of these movements that take into account what's happening actually on stage, who comes on stage, who leaves. Um, all these things are marked in, in this chapter. Some detail if there are people that are on stage that don't speak, but of course you have to think what they might be doing on stage. It's, it's important in, in Euripides' Electra. Uh, and I give names to these sections and subsections and suggest to the reader that they can do the same. In a sense, it's an approach that a director might take. Um, what, what, what I want to call this scene, what's the essential get, guest this up to use a Brechtian term. And in some sense, I borrow from Brecht's uh, practice in Le 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 to title scenes. So I give titles to each scene, that, in part mnemonically, but also to give, you, to give the reader some sense of what actually the essential event that happens in that scene, if something happens, or what is discussed, or to, in the chorus, what's, the, what's, what's what Mr. treated and why. Um, in the third chapter, um, I expand uh, away from the plot to include, I guess you might say, other plots. That is, how Euripides fits into the tradition of this myth and this story. And of course, the story of maybe not Electra, but Orestes and Aegisthus and Pythonestra and Agamemnon and the whole horrible myth of the House of Atreus pops up in the uh, directly in the Iliad, more, more directly um, in the underworld and the Odyssey. Um, so Euripides is drawing on Homer. He's also drawing on other um, lost, uh, lost to us um, uh, versions of the, uh, the story. And particularly uh, one that's not lost to us, Aeschylus' Oresteia, the trilogy that deals with this um, House of Atreus myth in great detail, and also Sophocles' Electra. Uh, so Euripides is a master of incorporating, transforming, challenging, subverting tradition 
So I called it reflecting and refashioning tradition. And this is one of the great things about working on tragic Greek tragedy is that there is a tradition in contemporary theater. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what that is because everybody is inventing their own plays and coming up with their own stories. And there's really often not a whole lot of relationship to that story to some other one. There may be, but it's a private story or one we don't know unless it's a story that incorporates popular culture and things like that. But for the Greeks, they had these great myths and they could play with them, vary them, explore them, challenge the way that they were, the story was told before, introduce an interesting angle that nobody would have expected. Euripides does that in, in Electra because he sets the play not in the palace, at the House of Atreus, the standard you know, place for this great revenge tragedy to take place, in this case, the murder of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus, but he actually has Aegisthus marry Electra off to a poor farmer and the play is set in front of his hovel on a mountainside farm. And that of course opens up all sorts of things in the, in the play and in the tradition and the myth that earlier versions never considered. So uh, uh, Euripides is a master of, um, well, they all were, but Euripides is just because he comes late latest among the great three. Um, he's a master at rethinking the tradition and this is certainly the case in Euripides' Electra. There's really um, nothing quite like it. In chapter four, what I call in order of appearance, characters and actors in Electra, I revert to the contemporary interest in character and say, okay, so if now we have the plot laid out and the plot in the sense of the way that the, um, uh, the events are organized and built and made more and le more or less dynamic. This is a way of actually looking at character, what people say about those characters, what they say about themselves, filled with inconsistencies and um, not that the chapter isn't, but the way characters portray themselves is often at odds with what we know about them. Uh, and that's certainly the case with the two main characters in the play Electra and Clytemnestra. And in fact, Euripides gives us a version of Clytemnestra that is certainly the most sympathetic we get in any of the tragedies uh, uh, that involve um, her murder. The next chapter moves into something very specific, um, something I'm keenly interested in, old fashioned word, language. We often think of tragedy because it's so foreign to us as uh, larger than life, which it was, um, big mythic outdoors, all of which it was. But unlike contemporary theater in which you can focus the audience's attention by a lighting and, you know, sitting in a black auditorium and you know, doing all the kinds of technical wizardry that uh, theater people like to do these days. In the ancient theater, um, it was big and open. And the thing that actually brought images before the audience was not something physical, which you might not even be able to see the distance that you might be sitting from the audience. For example, blood. But where the plays are rich, just like Shakespeare, is in language and language is key. And I spent a lot of time following uh, poetic imagery, um, looking at word repetition and variation, the way in which Euripides builds up a kind of poetic drama that goes alongside the action of the play. And um, of course, everything's transliterated, so it's perfectly available to someone who doesn't know Greek. And it's, it's quite intriguing. I mean, just take for one, one example, there's so many. Um, the way in which um, Euripides uses language to emphasize giving birth, because of course the play centers around the murder of a mother, Clytemnestra. And in this play, unlike any other, Elector draws or lures her mother to this rural farm of her farmer husband by claiming to have been given birth, given, to claim to have given birth to a child. So, uh, so many words are not just mother, but giving birth. Uh, children are viewed as that, the, that which, that, the, the, the woman that gave me birth, not just my mother. And that's one example. There are many others, the word blood and the different ways in which the word blood is used. Um, of course, this is also related to childbirth. And you get into a remarkably interesting um, and enriching reading of the play by attending very, very closely to the language that it unfolds in that, this, that the characters use and speak that Euripides gives them. This is also true in the choruses where character isn't as important. 
um, but language becomes a means of conveying action, imagery, color, power, all of that. Chapter six, uh, again, tries to, to keep uh, one's eye on the theater, but now moves away from language to setting costumes, props, and bodies, um, because they're not only the bodies of the actors, but also corpses are brought on stage, and they're quite important in the play, actually. Um, when they come in, how they come in, what people do with them. Um, so this is more the visual side. Um, but again, um, a lot of this is conveyed by a language. I mean, the setting of the place, we know what it is, but it's described, it could not have been given the, con con the const constrictions of tr tragic production, the fact that four plays would be done on the same day without time to redo a big set. Um, and then the next day, a different set of tragedies by a different playwright would have been done. It's clear that the setting is primarily evoked by language uh, in the case of Euripides Electra, of course, this mountainside hovel farmhouse that uh, Electra lives in with her husband, the farmer. Um, but it's important, and also costume and the way it's used, uh, props, uh, which are quite important in the play. Uh, because it's set on a farm, it's remarkable how many people come on with, uh, for Greek tragedy anyway, with, uh, uh, with actual stage props, including animals. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of, of, of richness in, in, in trying to look at the play via this uh, s a, a lens. Chapter seven moves into a more interpretive um, mode um, because as I mentioned, um, Euripides plays with tradition by having Electra married to a farmer, um, a poor farmer against his will and hers. Um, of course he has to go along with it, but he respects her um, status and he doesn't sleep with her. So she is in this crazy situation for a Greek woman anyway, of being both married and a virgin. And of course, I guess this marries her off because he knows that if he marries her to a poor person and they have a child, the child will not be able to challenge him for the throne. If she, if he married, if she had married a prince, of course, that would be quite different. So she, I guess this controls, if you will, or tries to control Electra's womb, hence this false child that Electra pretends to have given birth to, plays an important role. So in this chapter seven, I call it gender, sex, and reproductive roles. And if that's not enough, I put a colon, maleness, mothers, and offspring. And you can begin to see, just from my short description, how crucial this is to the play. Issue of gender roles, gender expectations, um, status of different genders, um, Orestes is a somewhat effeminate character, quite different from the way he's normally presented. Uh, Electra imagines him as a stalwart hero, absolutely courageous. What we actually see is someone who it refuses to admit he's Orestes because he's afraid, I guess, or overly cautious. Um, and Electra, of course, is extremely um, manly. She takes charge in all sorts of ways. She actually participates along with Orestes in killing her mother holding the sword along with him, which doesn't happen in any of the other um, treatments of the, of the myth, as far as we know. So these issues are really quite important, and I, I discuss in some sense how those issues continue to be important in, in people's lives. You know, what is gender identity, and where does it come from, and what does it put on people, and how much can they choose about that, and this is all, in some sense, um, anticipated, in some, some way anyway, in Euripides Electra. So it's an important part of um, the play. Chapter eight takes on the issue of class, as you can imagine, uh, given the uh, Electra's strange status, married virgin, married to a poor uh, farmer. Um, she complains about it all the time. On the other hand, the farmers has certain innate nobility, which is surprising, given that the Greeks would have thought, the ancient Greeks would have thought, well, you know, nobility must be connected to some kind of power and money and aristocracy and success. And that's not the case with the farmer, but so the whole issue of what constitutes nobility, um, uh, true worth, um, these seem to be obvious to us now, although as we well know, um, inheritance and privilege uh, go hand in hand with most success in the world. Um, in spite of everybody's claim that they, they made it on their own, we know that that's certainly often not the case. And one can trace some um, you know, inheritances and traditions, traditional privilege is replicating itself. But then in any case, the Euripides play spends a lot of time posing hard questions about what constitutes true nobility and uh, where does it 
lie and how does one see it and how can one know it and how can one see it uh, and see through uh, claims about it. Um, and in that sense, the farmer emerges quite, quite important uh, as an important, important um, touchstone in the play, even though he drops out of the play uh, before, and it makes sense that he does, just before um, the, the plot turns towards murder. In addition to dealing with the rich and poor, I also deal with, uh, in this chapter, with gods and mortals, because Euripides takes on, in a serious way, I believe anyway, some classicists disagree, but I think he has a problem with the nature of the anthropomorphic deities that the Greeks honored uh, when he was uh, in his society. I don't mean to say that he was an atheist or anti-religious in, in that sense, but he seemed to find something wrong with the power that gods manifest over humans, their distance from human beings, often their promotion of Im 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 human immorality, their rewarding, uh, rewarding, for, rewarding of it. And in particular, what he does at the end of the play, since the play is in a sense about the aftermath of the Trojan War, is he takes on that myth. Uh, he's not the first one to do it, but I think he's the first one to do it in tragedy. And he suggests at the end of the play was that when a god appears, a deus ex machina, and gives us the surprising news that actually Helen, a sensible cause of the Trojan War, never went to Troy, but Zeus fashioned an image of Helen, a sort of faux Helen, a phantom Helen, to spread death and destruction among mortals. What kind of god is that? Well, I mean, you name your religion, but it's not exactly what you hoped, and it certainly debunks the whole myth of heroism that the play tries to take on in other, in other ways. So this is a, one more radical way in which Euripides um, reinterprets the myth and asks us to think hard about the relationship between gods and mortals and what kind of gods we want to honor. A good question these days as well, since I'm sad to say our god these days is money, and um, you know, Radix Malorum. But in the same, finally in the same chapter, I maybe take a bit of a stretch and talk about the environment, um, what I call the sky and the earth, because given the setting of the play, the agricultural background of Greek society and the way in which this is, is brought to the fore in Euripides' play, the farmer goes off and plows his field. There's lots of agricultural metaphors that would be in Greek tragedy anyway, but this is brought to the fore by the farmer's occupation. Uh, by the contrast between the way he makes a living and the way um, the aristocracy inherit money from the above other people. But also how humans deal with the environment. There's a great chorus in which the uh, lyric section, which the chorus sing a myth about the adultery of a generation before, two generations uh, before the play, um, in which the adultery of um, um, uh, the, in the house of Atreus, so outrages the gods of Zeus that he changes the course of the sun and has a sun run the other way, causing havoc for parts of the earth. And then the explanation why the Sahara is you know, without um, rain. Uh, so a kind of environmental disaster is affected by uh, an account of something that human beings do. Now, it's not directly related to the environmental crisis we live in, but it's not completely uh, far-fetched to see Euripides suggesting that there are things that human beings do that has an effect on the environment. And then, and then what's so wonderful in this course is, of course, say, well, I don't believe that. But on the other hand, you know, these stories are good because they might keep people from, you know, acting in excessive ways uh, towards one another and towards the world they live in. So there's something in, the, in, this, tra in this chapter about, um, about the environment. And I'm increasingly interested in, in, in tragedies. It's, relationship to the um, environment, and I guess they, they wouldn't have called them that, but we would call them ecological questions. The last chapter is called Electors of the Looking Glass, as all the books in this series ask us to, ask the writers to um, consider how a, uh, the, the play we're dealing with has an afterlife, what kind of afterlife it had. And it's intriguing that Euripides Electra, although the myth continued for a long, 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 long time, pops up in Roman theater and uh, elsewhere. But Euripides' particular take on it does not. And it really took off in the um, early, very early part of the 20th century 
with the founding of the Royal Court Theater, you know, Harvey Granville Barker uh, and uh, Harley Granville Barker and um, Gilbert Murray, and connected to a whole, the whole sort of theater revolution that we associate with Chekhov and Strindberg and a little bit later O'Neill and Maeterlinck and all these uh, people in Europe and the whole you know, new theater movement. And Euripides was, in a sense, rediscovered the modern stage in association with that. George Bernard Shaw, uh, many connections with him. So this allows one to talk about the way in which Euripides entered the modern theatrical uh, landscape uh, viewed as a kind of, uh, he was in his time, an iconoclast, um, an intellectual playwright, philosophical, uh, asking hard-ass questions about society, politics, religion. Um, and then I talk about other versions uh, of Euripides, uh, like uh, productions of it, and then also um, some key productions in Greece and England, uh, as I mentioned, and also in, um, in France and other places. And then um, several playwrights who were inspired by uh, Euripides' Electra, um, Jean Giraudoux, his Electra, it's an extraordinary play, wonderful. Uh, Margaret Yorsenar's um, uh, version of Electra, the, the Fall of the Le Chute de Masque. And then uh, Eugene O'Neill, of course, in Morning Becomes Electra, although he draws particularly on Aeschylus, he also draws on um, Euripides' Electra in interesting ways and uh, Robinson Jeffers in The Tower Beyond Tragedy. And then I end with a, a bit on uh, Michael Kakandis' great film, Electra, 1962, um, shot in Mycenae with Winnie Pappas uh, and a score by Mikis Theodorakis. So that's something of my book report on the play. Um, I would encourage you to look at the play. The whole idea of this book is to get people to go back to the play and read it and consider it. And um, I hope that my little discussion about it gets you to do that. And um, the play is, the book will be available in the next year. And um, um, if you're interested in Euripides Electra, Euripides, Greek tragedy, I would encourage you to, to have a gander.